Andrew, thank you. Thank you for inviting me. Justin, and uh, I think it's, it's been an overwhelming experience. <coughs> um, when we conceived this initiative, and I was asked by my chairman, we were not, uh, I was in the uh, NMF, National Maritime Foundation at that time, uh, to write the concept paper for this uh, initiative. I can tell you we didn't have any ideas of big grandeur that it is now. Um, the Navy, of course, came in slightly later. And since I was convening the entire initiative from the NMF side, um, I could literally see the initiative grow. And uh, I think uh, that little initiative that we had at that time has really come of age. And for that, I would like to take my hat off to all the navies that have been participating and all the chiefs who have shown the stewardship in being a part of this initiative. Well, um, what I'm going to speak of today is not on this. This is not the reason why I've come. The main reason why I've come is to speak on maritime trade and maritime economy. What I will not really, um, I'm going to be forthright. I'm not going to bore you with the nauseating statistics which are given ad nauseum. You know, 90% of the trade goes by sea and so on and so forth. You hear it everywhere. I'm going to restrict myself to the Indian Ocean. And though I would have loved to speak a little more about the security aspects, I will speak about it very in the passing. But um, it's trade, which I felt and which Andrew insisted was um, something that needed focus and flagging. So here we are. Indian Ocean is a particularly heightened and concentrated form of global reality embodied in maritime commerce. And uh, you would have heard lots of definitions of Indian Ocean, but whatever it is, it is an active ocean. And you know, the range of activities range from trade, transportation of energy, because that's where the national interests lie, and asymmetric challenges, which I'll just be glossing over. Um, just some aspects of trade. I know this is a mainly a security um, audience, but I think trade is equally important. Um, it is most of the trading people who are associated with shipping feel that they are misunderstood or not understood in the security circles. That's a hard reality um, because they are not seen. To the landlubbers, in any case, they are not seen, so they don't know much about it. Uh, but the fact is that maximum amount of trade does go on in the Indian Ocean, and in fact, it is the lifeline, slocks are the lifelines of many of the littorals. And uh, the essence of economic globalization is on the bulwark of slock security. Um, of course, there have been innumerable, in, uh, innumerable incidents where interdiction of slocks have led to serious consequences. I will not give you statistics. I will not mention the Gulf War and so on and so forth. 465 ships were interdicted, so on and so forth. But let us take it, and most of you are aware of it. That's why I'm not going to go over. But it can have disastrous effects on uh, the country's economy. I was just telling some of the country, in fact, Taiwan and all, I said, look, uh, you really don't have to fire a shot to get the economy to the knees. Just interdict the slocks, and there you have it. Um, just to give you some amount of statistics, it is global seaborne trade was around 21,480 billion ton miles in 1999. And then by linear uh, projection, and most of the strategists do linear projections. They hate to do non-linear projections. It's more difficult, that's why. Uh, and you don't know what's, what's the result. So. They expected it to rise to 41,800 billion ton miles by 2014, 
But then 2008 happened. These things always happen, you know. Um, there was this economic meltdown, and the shipping industry came into a slump. There was a slow turnaround, and I've given the figures. 2010, there was a 2% 2, 2 growth, which led to an 8.6% 8 growth in the world fleet. Uh, and sea trade grew by 4% in 2011. Now, I just thought I will highlight some of the aspects that are a little unusual for the navies with respect to the shipping industry. Uh, things are slightly different. One is that there is a lag time. Um, it's also true for the navies, of course, but uh, we are not aware of it being part of the navy. Uh, that is, you do a capital investment, try to get a ship, and it obviously takes about three, four years. By that time, if there is a meltdown, there's a problem. Because, um, for example, in 2008, the decline in trade volumes led to a decline in freight revenues. The chartering rates fell. There was overcapacity, and people didn't know what to do because they were losing money. Um, however, the other aspect is that shipping trade and the increase in size and specialization of vessels has been accompanied by a high degree of automation. Most of the merchant vessels, as we call them, are so highly automated that huge vessels have got very few crews, as many of you might be knowing, very few crews. So, but what is more important strategically is that there are new shipping conglomerates and super port uh, corporations. Some of them are of Chinese origin, and this is creating new dynamics uh, in the maritime commerce. Uh, mind you, I do not like to give morality aspects to any of this, because is it good, is it bad? In international relations, there is no good, there is no bad. There is only national objective and national interest. It's either in my national interest or not in my national interest. There are no permanent friends, there are no permanent enemies. And in such a case, what is happening is smaller powers like Singapore and some Gulf countries are wielding influence which is very disproportionate to their size. Again, no morality. Um, the sizes of ships are increasing and over the years, but is it really uh, beneficial, if I may use the term? Uh, they first increased to the Panmax threshold, which was about uh, 4,000 to 8,000 TEUs. Then they reached the Suzmax, and now they are going into the new Panmax levels. But you know what happens? You keep increasing the size of these vessels, the ports cannot take them. And then the companies think, wh wh where am I going to put that ship in? If it carries cargo to a particular port, you, you don't have a port or an alternate port where it can um, uh, go and uh, uh, discharge all its fuel, all take in uh, all the uh, cargo that it's indebted to. So there are problems of infrastructure. Um, so essentially, the benefits of scale at sea, and it's the cheapest form of transportation, it's more uh, cheaper to get a ton, let's say, of cargo from United States all the way uh, to, let's say, Asia, Philippines, or Japan, than to get it from Washington to Los Angeles by land. I mean, this is what has been worked out. So you see how cheap it is. But we will lose that edge if you do not have infrastructure which sort of is capable of taking in these large ships, etc. So it is not always beneficial to go in for too large a ship. Another aspect which I thought I must highlight is the emergence of shipping hubs. Um, you know, most of the cargo in the world today is being carried by containers. Now, almost 90% of the cargo. What this has happened strategically is something which I will mention slightly later. But in this, what has happened is the earlier days to carry the, car, uh, the containers over large distances. So what has essentially happened is, here, you have intermediate, you have intermediate hubs 
that are all over the equator, near the equator. And that's how the system works. So rather than having very long distances of travel, you got these hubs. Now, the large vessels are used for traveling longer distances, while the smaller vessels do the feeder, feeder routes. This is how the entire hub and spoke system is working. There are problems in this, which I will uh, mention later on. So this is what the freight transport system is working on. Uh, I will not de uh, have too much of a time on this. These are some of the mathematical aspects, which I know which probably may interest you, may not, um, of seeing how well the country is uh, integrated into the entire system. This is liner shipping connectivity index, and it's a measure of the country's connectivity to maritime shipping and is a measure of the trade facilitation. Uh, the highest uh, LSCI values are export-oriented economies like China, Hong Kong, and Singapore, which are essentially, uh, Singapore especially, is a transshipment hub. And the other constant, again, I will gloss over it. I will not go deep, but I'll go on to something more. That is a uh, Baltic Dry Exchange Index. Again, a fundamental uh, barometer of the state of global trade and it measures the demand of shipping vis-a-vis -vis the supply of bulk carriers. So it's calculated almost every day. Uh, in my paper, I've given a fairly detailed expose of how it works, but um, uh, that's not really important for this. A word before I go on to the types of uh, trade of privatization. Now, this is essentially what is happening in all over the world. The national governments are realizing that unless you privatize the ports, the level of efficiency is not to the level that is desired. So there is an increasing trend of seeking infusion of finances from private for private public participation. This is the general trend which is happening. And you know, uh, ports are nearly $50 billion worth of business in various sectors. Now I come to security issues. I know, um, uh, again, let me be forthright. Uh, in many of these seminars, and one attends quite a few of them, I keep hearing, look, let us cooperate. Let us cooperate on uh, security issues. That was the tenor over there earlier, and that was the tenor on which IONS is built. But after we go back, and everybody, of course, nods his head gravely and then goes back and says, yeah, let us cooperate. But there are problems. There is something known as that I've not mentioned here, something known as the hierarchy of relevance. What is relevant to you may not be relevant to me. What is important to you may not be as important to me. Then why should I cooperate unless we come to a same grid? Just to give you a small example, for the Australians, illegal immigration by sea is a very important aspect. For the Indians, is it that important? No, I don't think so. So, you know, when we talk to each other, we've got to keep these aspects at the back of our mind. We've got to know that, look, what is relevant to you need not necessarily have the same relevance to me. So we should come to a same frequency. And that's most important when we are talking of security cooperation, which I just wanted to highlight. But, you know, uh, with the rise of trade, and that is only with the rise of trade that maritime security has become uh, more important. We have uh, been talking about piracy in the question answer session. If uh, I can go into as much detail about piracy, Somalian piracy, as you want, including telling you as to how much does the lead jumper get. He gets about $5,000 and it looks good on his CV. By the way, they all have a CV. Anyway, so uh, we can discuss that, uh, but that's not my uh, presentation. We can discuss as to how maritime terrorism has changed its format. Earlier, I used to be laughed at when people used to say, please look into maritime terrorism. And then Mumbai blasts happened, and they said, yeah, yeah, oh my God, that's right. Uh, now we know how it is changing. Okay, countering these threats, of course, requires cooperative approaches, as I mentioned, keeping in back of the mind hierarchy of relevance and assistance of, of course, more capable uh, navies in capacity building. Um, 
ions is a very effective, it can be more effective, I think, but it's all up to us, <coughs> participants of ions, and like IORA, ADMM+, ARF, and so on and so forth. So I will uh, not go into too much of detail on the security aspects, though I would love to, but uh, time is short. Just to give you an idea of this is the type of environment that we all live in. Yeah. These are all the things that is happening. Human trafficking, light arms trafficking, narcotics, war, severe crisis, and piracy. And like I said, we could ask for uh, more details about piracy later on. Coming back to trade, um, well, yes. Um, as you know, containerized cargo is the most important aspect which is uh, relevant today. And overall sea trade basically consists of bulk cargo, general, or general cargo, and then you have liquid bulk, dry bulk, and specialist bulk. Um, I will go on to each of these. Containerized cargo. Now, as of day before yesterday, about 20 million cargoes are there, and about 90% of the world trade is carried by cargo uh, containers. Um, three important, there have been a very important uh, development in which three of the largest companies in the world have come together and formed an alliance in which 40 to 50% of the cargo, container cargo, is going to be carried by them. Does it sound like a monopoly? Yes, it is. But the American Maritime Commission has approved it, and we've got to see what it means. Here, I've given some statistics. So about 80%, like I said, is containerized. Uh, in IOR, we are talking about IOR, only 25% of the cargo is unfortunately ca container containerized because we are not that developed. Um, and what does this lead to? This means you must have more ports. So the countries have actually got to invest in more ports. That's heavy investment. So um, this is what I was telling you about. The P3, Marsec Line, CMA, CGM, Mediterranean Shipping, they have 255 vessels and 2.6 million containers. So is it good or bad? I don't know. Of course, to counter that, there is Hapagloid and CSAV to challenge the P3, but that's still some way off. Tanker trade. Of course, you know the tanker trade is important, and at the moment after the 2008, there's consolidation. Um, it might interest you to know, um, I'm sure our um, uh, Iranian uh, uh, delegates are well aware of this. What had happened was that in 2008, whatever unsold heavy crude was there used to be put away in VLCCs and ULCCs. This is oil contago. You keep the crude over there on sea, and when the prices go up, you sell the crude. Um, well, it happens even in the local market, but this used to happen in the, um, uh, in, uh, at sea also. Liquid bulk. Uh, with the usage of petroleum and other liquid fuels growing, and I've given you, I'll give you a figure of how much it is growing, um, liquid bulk is one of the most important trades which go on. The countries can actually come to a grinding halt if this is interdicted. And uh, you have the resource heartland and you have the demand periphery. The energy goes from the resource heartland to the demand periphery and uh, I think there shouldn't be any introduction of slots because that's in. This is the consumption that we are talking of. Um, before I come to that, let me just tell you, India's dependence on, uh, dependence on oil imports is going to be 92.6% by 2020, while for China it is going to be 76.4. So we are dependent. And you know, I've talked of the uh, periphery, the demand periphery. This is the crude oil movement that takes place across the Indian Ocean. Exporting countries and who are the importers? I've given it also outside the Indian Ocean, but. LNG and LPG. Uh, this sector didn't really fall too much during the 2008 uh, uh, meltdown. 
but uh, it was affected because the Japanese stopped buying uh, LNG and LPG. They're one of the biggest uh, importers. But now there has been a turnaround and there is a slow turnaround. Um, the best part is they hire these, they charter these vessels for 20 years. So that sort of obviates the ups and downs which are normally associated. Yeah. Uh, we are one of the largest, even though we have got one of the largest reserves of coal, it is not high quality. We require coal for all our thermal plants and steel plants. So we get it from Australia. Trade in coal, for South Africa, Indonesia, and Australia, they account for more than half of the world's coal. So I've essentially given you a chart of what are the commodities, who all trades in it. It's given in my paper, which I've given. I don't know whether it's been distributed or not. I hope it'll be. Uh, this is the world fleet trade. I will not go into too much of this. Um, quickly, I will cover three important countries. Um, do we have some time? Or? Oh, okay. So I'll rush through. I'll quickly cover India and uh, China. I'll not cover the other countries, and, and I'll give you uh, my final uh, recommendations. Uh, even though India is not a significant uh, country in the global shipping, and nothing compared to China, or Korea, or Japan, it has a growing role, probably geographically, probably due to various other reasons. And I've given you the statistics. The merchandise exports are just 1%, uh, over 1% of the world's merchandise exports. Uh, this is our composition. We have tried to diversify. Manufactured goods comprise about 70% of the exports. And uh, <coughs> we are moving towards a service-oriented GDP. Um, while there was a recession, again, 2008, not so much, but it is picking up now, as you can see. Most of it, of course, is importers' intermediate goods. Um, our shipping will grow, and with that, of course, unfortunately, most of our ships and containers come to a port known as JNPT, uh, which is near Mumbai. 50% of our containers end up over there. Uh, this is our annual growth projections. Uh, China, it's the most significant driver of trade and shipping, but um, what they have done to increase their energy security is they have tried to diversify the sources as well as to shorten the shipping routes. Um, of course, one must remember, just if you have energy assets all over the world does not necessarily mean you can pick up the energy and get it home. The system doesn't work that way. That is, if you have it in Africa, you just can't pick it up from there and get it to uh, the coastal towns of China. It, the system doesn't allow for that. Here, earlier China used to require 25 VLCCs from Africa and uh, 24 VLCCs from, Gulf of China, uh, from the Gulf to China. By 2020, 58 VLCCs will be required from Gulf and 53 from Africa. So you see the raise in traffic. I will, um, sorry, but I think I'll, I'll, these are the last two um, slides that I have. What do we gain out of all this that I've, sorry, that I've mentioned? Um, there is going to be an increasingly dependence on energy from the Gulf because what is happening is in many of the other places, there is a tend to plateau off. Um, many of the other places, not all. What I'm looking at is this will increase the traffic in the Indian Ocean region <coughs> and put pressure on the choke points. Containerization in IOR does not go over 25%. Now, um, that needs to be enhanced because um, Otherwise, we'll need more ports. And in turn, it'll increase the coastal traffic. Um, ships of sizes are going to increase. I, I talked to you in great detail about ship sizes and what are the um, con side of it. But it is going to increase to a certain degree and then plateau off. Uh, up till now, the larger ships operate on the global networks, while uh, 
the medium ships are forced to operate in the feeder networks. That is going to continue. Um, we are going to have the P3 alliance I told you about. And what that is going to really mean, only time will tell. It's not a very nice development. The South-South trade is growing. And the importance of developed economies like Europe is coming down, especially in the case of Africa, where there's a lot of energy flowing out. I didn't take it on. But it is the importance of the developed uh, economies is reducing. And uh, lastly, more and more companies will try and privatize their ports because that's where the efficiency comes from. And I didn't give you a, sl a slide on what are the ports doing, but then that would be going too much into detail. It's there in the article. Uh, my conclusion is, sorry, primarily seaborne trade in the Indian Ocean is likely to remain diverse and vibrant in the foreseeable future. The emerging patterns of vessel trade across the ocean will be shaped by their economic efficiencies. Thank you very much.